fabulous panel here who's going to give it uh, a, a nice flavor to tell us from different perspectives how they see this. So we have um, cognitive scientists here, we have tech journalists, and we have data scientists. So um, what I want to do is I, I first want to start a little bit uh, looking at what is creative AI? How do we think it's going to um, affect us? And I think I want to start first with our cognitive scientist here, who is um, Abiba Birhan, and uh, she's from Ethiopia, doing her PhD in Ireland. And um, Abiba, could you please tell us a little bit about your perspective on artificial intelligence and society? Um, I know that you look at philosophers from the West and also philosophers here from Africa. Could you give us some more perspective on that? Thank you. Thank you very much, Lydia. Sure, uh, as uh, Lydia said, I am a cognitive scientist working at the intersection of uh, cognition, uh, society, and, and technology. Uh, so uh, before I can say my view uh, about technology and, and, and society and AI, I have to give a little background uh, about my research and two different contrasting views of uh, what cognition is and what the person is. Uh, so this is a really crude simplification. They, they are not as simply as binary as I present them now. So on the one hand, we have a very Western individualistic conception of uh, cognition, conception of the self that is really grounded on, on the individual person. It, um, it comes from the huge landmarks uh, of philosophers such as Rene Descartes. Um, he, he, lo he logically deduced uh, through his meditations everything that can be doubted in order to arrive at something that is absolutely certain, uh, which is cogito ergo sum, which is the fact that he can think. So everything is a anything any social aspects, any relational aspects are kind of pushed aside as something that are not concrete foundations for our knowledge. So a lot of our thinking on cognition really builds up on that um, really individualistic perspective where we take the person as a unit of study as if the person can be totally separated from the, their culture, from their background, from their community. Uh, and. Um, we fo solely focus on the brain in order to get at cognition. Uh, so the other perspective I want to contrast is, um, comes from Ubuntu. Uh, Zulu people say, um, it, it, they totally contrast what Descartes has been building upon. I am because we are, because we are, therefore I am. So the very idea of cognition and the very idea of uh, a person is really built upon the community. I can exist because I exist in a community. Aspect of m my cognition, aspect of who I am, really depends upon my relationship, to my connections to the community. Uh, okay, so those are the, the two perspectives. And uh, going back to my own research and how this relates to uh, the foundations of AI. Uh, so we talk about cognition, we talk about Creativity, we talk about intelligence. In a sense, from that really Cartesian individualistic perspective, because we, we gather data points, um, we cut, we severely cut connections and relationships as if we can get at the cognition or as if we can develop an intelligence system that is completely discrete from what's going on. Uh, and a lot of our understanding in, in, in AI and cognition is really clouded by that. Uh, because you can, the, the, the problem with the Ubuntu perspective that we are continually changing, we, are, we exist embedded in society, in our, in our bodies, in our relationships, it doesn't lend itself for a really neat uh, computational model. You can't, it, it's because it's messy. It's messy, but it, it reflects reality. Uh, so it's easier to opt out for the much simpler, the much neater option of uh, the, the, the Western perspective. Uh, 
So coming back to AI, creativity, and cognition, uh, for me, it's really difficult, if not impossible, to, to, to create, to build machines that can be as creative or as intelligent as humans, because humans, by definition, are continually changing, embedded in relationships, and embedded in language, embedded in culture, and that is essentially not something that we can encode into machines. Uh, I think I've gone over time. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's my take. Thank you, that is fascinating. I think uh, it would be nice to get Karen's perspective if we think about the community and how we're connected. Karen, you're a tech journalist, you go out there, you go to the communities, you see what the trends are, how people are reacting to technologies. Could you give us your take on how are people seeing and embracing or not embracing AI and, and what are you seeing when you go out there and do that? Um, hi, everyone. So I'm an artificial intelligence reporter at MIT Technology Review, so I spend most of my time, as Lydia just mentioned, talking with researchers, talking with executives, um, understanding how people are creating AI and how people are using or being impacted by AI. Um, and for me, when I interpret the question, creative AI, it's, it's a bit of an existential question of what does it mean to be human in the age of AI? I think that's a question that um, when in my reporting I come across quite often, people grappling with um, if AI is starting to manifest all of these different skills that have um, in the past been inherently human, where does that leave us? Um, I'm a bit of an optimist in that I think throughout history, the history of technology, um, we have always kind of confronted this question. We build technology to do things better than humans. That has always been true. It's not really unique with artificial intelligence. I think what is unique is the pace of change at which AI is able to um, adopt more and more skills. And so we, as humans, are put in a unique um, new pressure to, to evolve ourselves and change and educate ourselves um, and continue keeping up with that pace of change. Um, in terms of going to your question about how I have seen people engage with this existential question, um, an example I like to give is um, there are algorithms now that are really good at uh, mimicking art. So does that mean that now artists have become obsolete? Um, and I think that um, there, are, there are ways in which um, some artists, I'm sure, are uh, feeling perhaps blown away by the pace of change and aren't really sure how to uh, perfect their art in these new situations, but there are also ways in which artists have really created, um, have, bec have created, used these technologies and basically used them as, um, added a new tool in their toolbox to take ownership of the artistic narrative again. Um, so the example that I have is there's this woman, um, and I unfortunately can't remember her name anymore, but she created this beautiful exhibit that recently was um, presented in Europe of tulips. So she um, used an algorithm called a GAN, or Generative Adversarial Network, where um, it's really, really good at synthesizing these hyper-realistic images. And what she did was she created her own data set of all of these different tulips, fed it into this algorithm, and it created all these really beautiful tulip images that had never really existed. And for her, that was now her new form of art, whereas before we might have used a paintbrush as a tool to paint pictures, she's now using a computer as a tool to create these beautiful things that previously didn't exist. And it is still um, an extension of her vision, her imagination, but she just has more powerful tools at her disposal. AI basically augments her. Yes, exactly. Instead of replaces her. Exactly. So I think that um, the, I think as an optimist, um, when we develop technology, it does always have a potential to augment us, um, but it's certainly not a passive road. We have to be really active about making sure that the technology we develop does augment us and does augment everyone. So it has to be inclusive as well. Thank you for that. I think now is probably a really good moment to talk to people who are making this technology. And um, I would like Munir, maybe if you could share some words as a data scientist, as an engineer that creates algorithms. Thanks, Lydia. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I've got a few slides that I'd like to share with you just to illustrate some of the things that I'll be talking about, particularly for those who are not familiar with uh, 
the creative AI. Can you please put the slides on? Okay, this is not working. <laughs> okay, so can AI be uh, creative? This is the topic of this panel. Um, first, uh, it seems that humans have been reluctant to uh, recognize um, machine intelligence. And uh, humans have been setting the bar higher and higher uh, for machines. We used to think that um, only humans can play chess very well, and in 1997, IBM Deep Blue managed to develop this system and managed to beat the uh, world champion, Gasparov, in 1997. And then it was, uh, they said, okay, this is not really intelligence, uh, it was just brute force approach. Um, so the bar was set even higher than this. So the question was whether machines can understand um, human language and, and, and answer questions. So again, IBM in 2011, IBM Watson managed to, uh, to beat the world champion in a game TV program called Jeopardy. And then the Go game, this is a board game that was thought to be really difficult for uh, uh, machines to play because it's not just based on the same rules as chess. But again, in 2017, Google, Google DeepMinds managed to develop a system called AlphaGo that managed to beat the world champions at this game. See that bar is, set, is being set higher and higher. And the question was, was whether the machine can debate, can engage in a debate with a human. Uh, and again, in uh, 2019, IBM developed a system called Project Debater and played against one of the um, uh, debate champions. It didn't win, um, but it, it managed to really understand the nuances and the weaknesses of the opponent. The question was uh, whether a government should uh, subsidize preschool. And the machine, the IBM machine, was debating and coming up with arguments basically in, in, in favor of the resolution. Uh, it didn't win the debate, but it was really impressive to see a machine debating, not just answering questions like in Watson, but debating and understanding the nuances and the weakness of the opponent and so on. Now, the bar is being even set higher. Now, the question is whether machines can be creative. So this is the topic of this panel. So first, what is the... Uh, okay. Um, first, we have to have a consensus on creativity. It seems that there are two criteria for this. The first one is novelty. So we have to have something that is new in forms of uh, new forms of production, new ways of thinking, or acting. The second criterion is value. The thing that is being created has to have value for the creator or for a group of people. So it could be either beautiful, useful, therapeutic, influential, transformative. And machines have managed to satisfy both criteria. I'll show you just a few examples that have been produced by machines. So if you look at this painting, this was generated by a machine and it was auctioned for 432,500 US dollars. So if you look at the signature at the bottom, this is a mathematical formula that generated this, this painting. It's amazing. It's not just about painting. If you look at the, um, the picture about the, um, the London Symphony Orchestra playing, performing music that was composed by a machine called Transits, and it was performed by the London Symphony Orchestra. In the middle, I don't have a pointer here, but in the middle, this is a heliograph. This is a uh, machine intelligence or artificial intelligence system that was developed by the Washington Post to, uh, to write articles and reports and even send tweets. It covered uh, the Rio Olympics, but also the election day in the US. In the bottom, you have a novel that was written by a computer, a Japanese novel that ended the competition in Japan. It didn't win the competition, but it went through to, through to the second round. And the uh, trailer that was um, uh, developed by a machine for the film Morgan. And the celebrities that we have on the right, can you recognize of any of those celebrities? They do not exist. They were generated by a computer. They look so real. So the idea behind this is a, um, a machine learning method called GAN, Generative Adversarial Network. I'm going to explain this very briefly without going into the details. The idea is this. 
We have an apprentice or student that is trying to come up with um, drawing, for example, painting or music, and you have a master. The master is telling the student whether what has been produced is any good or not. The student will learn from the feedback of the master, but also from the, uh, the examples, the paintings or the music that, that are available out there, and will learn by example. So a human apprentice would take years to learn this, but a computer can do this and, 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 and provide paintings or music uh, millions of times a second. So th therefore it can learn very fast and very quickly. This is the idea behind GAN. And there is a new artistic movement called Ganism. So after Impressionism, uh, Pointillism, and Fauvism, now we have Ganism, which is a new artistic movement. Artists together with computers, with programmers, they come up with new forms of art and so on. So this is the idea behind GAN that my colleague was talking about earlier. I think I'm going to stop here, a lot of technical details. But I think I'm um, in favor of the idea that computers can augment um, human capabilities or human creativity, basically, instead of replacing uh, humans. And I think that's the key. It's really about augmentation instead of replacement and giving us new tools, as Karen was saying. Um, I'd like to now turn to Tufik. Could you perhaps, as a data scientist, you're also an engineer here, give us a perspective also from here in Morocco. We are all very privileged to come to your beautiful country. So tell us about it. Thank you, Laida. Uh, actually, tackle, uh, tackling the, uh, the, the relationship between uh, AI and society is a very, very good topic for me because as a data scientist or as a machine learning engineer, we don't have a lot of, uh, a lot of time to, uh, to uh, think about uh, uh, AI and machine learning in a society and uh, in an uh, identity-wise uh, uh, aspect. So I think what we, are do, what we are doing here is really good to uh, bridge the gap between uh, tech people and also the, uh, uh, the, 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 the governors uh, and the social, uh, 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 social uh, uh, workers and uh, the political uh, actors. Uh, actually, for, for, uh, for Morocco and for, uh, for Africa in general, uh, I think uh, uh, governments and uh, tech companies and uh, also big uh, non-tech, uh, non-technical companies uh, such as uh, uh, OCP, where I work as a data scientist, I think uh, they have a, a very big, uh, uh, um, a very big mission, which is try to have uh, uh, to build an ecosystem uh, to uh, to nourish and uh, develop uh, uh, startups and uh, also. Uh, uh, also uh, uh, students to work on uh, AI and also its, uh, its impact with uh, uh, its impact on society and our identity. Uh, I think as you know uh, data for now uh, has been growing in uh, an exponential speed. Uh, we have uh, uh, not only data, not only the amount of data but also uh, the, the technology behind storing and collection and the collection of this data uh, is very developed and uh, it, it's keeping developing uh, from day to day. Uh, and also the, the processing power of, uh, uh, to process this data. So these three aspects uh, help us to, uh, uh, to build uh, uh, a very good uh, uh, AI algorithms that can, uh, for example, outperform humans. Uh, we, we just saw in, in the in last January uh, uh, we, we saw that, for example, DeepMind, which is uh, 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 part of Google, uh, developed uh, an AI that outperformed uh, a champion on, uh, on an online, uh, uh, online gaming platform called uh, StarCraft. So uh, we see that, and only uh, training an algorithm for hours uh, in contrast to, to the, the human champion who is, uh, uh, who is uh, playing the game for, uh, for uh, his entire life. Uh, so uh, we, we can see that, uh, uh, we, can, we, can see, we can say that uh, AI has a very big impact uh, uh, in the future and has a very big impact right now. Uh, so we have, we have 
to work uh, tightly, uh, tech companies, uh, governments, and uh, uh, social and political actors in order to enhance and uh, uh, enhance the, the uh, uh, how we deal with data and how we deal with uh, with AI in general. Thank you for that. Before we open up for questions, I'd like to ask everyone about what they think um, the AI role has with our humanity. Do you think that AI can be like a human? Um, should artificial intelligence um, have some sort of rights? Um, so just what are your thoughts if AI could replicate humans accurately? I'll, I'll start here with Munir and then we'll go all the way down and end with Abiba. So really the question is whether um, creativity is just about the reproduction of cognitive functions or is it also important to consider cognitive uh, dimension, anything that pertain to cognition, um, emotions, sensitivity, and so on. If you think of Beethoven, for example, uh, it's just, uh, is Beethoven just a collection of, uh, um, of uh, music that it, it was composed by the, uh, the, the artist? So it's also about his life, sensitivity, his life experience, his suffering, and so on. Really, the question is, uh, do emotions play a role in creativity? And because uh, machines cannot have emotions, I think, some people believe that it's just a matter of time before we can also simulate emotions in machines. There are two sc uh, schools of thought, basically. One that thinks that the brain is just a very complicated machine and we just don't understand em uh, emotions. And emotions are not illogical. It's just a matter of time before you can understand them and then program these emotions in, in machines. The other school of thought is, says that emotions are illogical. And because machines are built on logical processes, then we can never build machines that, are, that have, can have emotions. Machines can mimic or can simulate emotions, but they cannot have or feel emotions. And I think the question for me is, if creativity is also about emotions, and if emotions can be simulated, can machines have emotions or not? To me, this is really the, the big question uh, and the open question for the time being. Um, my personal view is that emotions can be simulated and mimicked by computers, but they cannot be felt or had by computers. And therefore, the question really is whether, it's not whether we can consider something that has been created by a machine to be um, uh, a piece of art, the question is really whether we can consider the computer to be an artist. I think there is a major difference between the two questions. It's a lot of food for thought. Thank you for that. Karen? Um, so I, I think I want to approach this question by saying that I don't necessarily know if it matters whether AI is creative or not because we are creating AI and we can decide what we want AI to do for our society. Um, and I, I think currently in the history of the field, there's sort of been this obsession around recreating human intelligence specifically, um, but I think there's a bubbling movement among researchers saying that um, why should we be recreating human intelligence when we already have humans? Why not help, uh, why not create machine intelligence to be good at the things that humans are not good at, rather than to try to be good at the things that we're already good at? Um, and so in terms of like what the role AI should have in society, we can define that and um, we, can, we can be thinking outside the box, not just, um, not just creating it in with, um, to be the same as us, but rather to be different in the ways that um, we know we have our weaknesses. Yeah, I think for the, the question of creativity of AI, I think for now, for the state of the art of machine learning right now, we cannot talk about uh, an AI that is self-aware and an AI that's, that is uh, conscious. This is really, we are really far away from, from, from this because for now we can create AIs that can outperform humans in specific tasks, for example, computer vision. Uh, computer vision is now one of the the, the field that can help us, for example, uh, uh, drive, car, uh, guide the driverless cars. Uh, also, we can have AI agents that can outperform uh, humans in games, in, 
in board games like Go or StarCraft. Uh, but for the main while, I, I don't think that we can talk about uh, an AI that can have its own creativity uh, because uh, also we, uh, I don't think we have, uh, we have for now an AI that can uh, at least uh, gather uh, or uh, outperform humans in many tasks at once. So we have just uh, an AI that outperform human in this task, in this task, in this task, and not in all that, that tasks uh, uh, combined. Yes, I agree with you. We are very good at do very specific domains. We are good at creating machines that are really good at uh, computer vision or speech recognition or whatever, but not combining the whole, the, the, the whole individual human capabilities. Um, so that's general, artificial general AI. That's, uh, I think that's far outreach. Uh, but coming back to uh, Munir's point about uh, creativity and AI, the two criteria you gave were uh, novelty and value. Uh, I, I, I'd like to contest that. Uh, I don't think novelty is demarks AI as uh, creative because I can just hit keys on a piano and I could come up with novel notes, but that doesn't mean I'm creative. For creativity to be recognized, there has to be some social uptake, communities, collectives, people have to, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll get to value as well, have to, to recognize it. And this is the point uh, the Harvard professor Sean Kelly addresses in his work in creativity and AI. Uh, so this is why cre AI can't be creative, because creativity is essentially embedded in what is socially and normatively as accepted as you know, creative or as novel. And coming back to your point on value, value necessarily entails an individual, a person. Value for who? Aesthetically pleasing for who? For people, for the collective, for the society, right? So it, it comes back to, to you know, society again. And uh, for me, that's it. We are way far off, and a lot of, a lot of the discussion on AI and creativity, as this panel itself illustrates, is, it comes, it comes really, um, it's really dif difficult to differentiate what is overhype and what the field AI actually has achieved so far. If you look at critics, for me, personally, much of what we hear about AI is overhyped, blown out of proportion. We don't have great machines as the media and some academics themselves made them out to be. And the definition of AI itself is much contested. What is AI? A lot of creativity and AI focuses around we will have AI when we have created conscious machines, right? What about the recommender systems are AI. When you use Google Maps to get from point A to point B, it's some sort of AI. Face recognitions are an aspect of AI. So all this overhype and all this so much focus on creating conscious AI is not actually only overhype. It's also you know, problematic and damaging in some sense because it takes away the spotlight from the really important issues such as you know, biases and injustices that are filtering through the social algorithms that are, whether we are going to a bank to get a loan, to get insurance, or to apply for a job, those are the real danger. How many of us are afraid of clicking a like on a Facebook riot because we know our employers might look at it and they might prevent us from having a job? I think those are the real issues. And they are still part of AI, I think. <laughs> well, I do agree that there is a hype, that AI is a bit of a hype. But I think uh, AI is not perfect. Um, but I think in terms of um, creativity in art, um, AI can be used to amplify 
um, the creativity of the human can also be used to explore uh, new things. This is really something like a um, team work between the computer and the artist to come up with something that is even more exciting than what human alone can produce. Um, when you say that uh, machines can be, cannot be creative, I don't agree with this because what has been produced by GAN, for example, the network that I was uh, talking about, the idea behind this is to learn what makes, for example, a style of painting really the, um, the generative process that makes, for example, impressionism. And by learning from example, by looking at hundreds or thousands of paintings of that particular style, the computer can learn this style and can generate new paintings of that same style. So I think this is learning a manifold, which is a creativity space for that particular style. And the computer can produce paintings within that manifold. But I agree with you that a computer cannot come up with a new manifold, with a new creativity space, a new style of painting. You will not be able to do that for the time being. But you will be able to, within the framework, within the manifold that it has learned from, create new, new paintings and new, and new things. And I think this is creativity. It's not because we have a, uh, an artist that draws painting within a particular style. If somebody else comes along and, and do the same thing, we should just say, oh, this has been produced by that particular artist, so we, we're not going to consider you an artist. So why do we have different treatment for machines? If machines can produce paintings that are um, similar to in style to other of the paintings that exist, why are we saying that this is not creativity? So this is the question that I ask my friend, uh, Adebe. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> again, f for me, there has to be a social uptake. Y yeah, you, your guns can create, uh, yeah, the, the painting, the Christie painting was, uh, yeah, it was, it was an art. And uh, for me, it also rep represents the height of AI overhype. Why would anybody want to spend that much amount of money on something that doesn't even make sense? Maybe, <laughs> maybe, it's, maybe it's because this, this type of AI and creativity and creating conscious machine is advanced by people who have first world problems, people whose facial faces are not constantly being tracked, people who are not being denied loans, people who are not, uh, you know, disadvantaged from the, the real trade of AI. Maybe it, it, it reflects what is preoccupying the people that are on power, that are advancing in developing the field. Maybe they should stop and think, what are the real problems? Who is being affected? Can we go and ask the people that are actually being affected? What would they like? What should we change? Uh, that's my take. <laughs> Um, so I talked to somebody about this uh, art piece that was sold at Christie's and um, he, we were talking about it as a platform and you talk about society's uptake and we are the ones as a society and there's some groups in society that have more power than others that get to determine what's important and what's not. And so his response to um, that painting at Christie's is he said when you go there what you're doing is you're buying um, status and power. and so. I, I do think that there's a lot of room for creativity and all that, but I understand where you're coming from when you talk about that we give, we as a society, we give value to things. Whether it is a, a brand name of a car or a clothing line or a certain type of food that becomes very popular, um, we're the ones collectively that em embrace that and, and make that uh, valuable. Um, I know we're talking about creativity, but you make very good points about uh, the discrimination and how that's an important thing. Luckily, there are some people who are looking into algorithmic bias, and there are a few companies that are coming up that are trying to see if they can take out uh, bias from code and see who's being discriminated against. But I think it's really interesting to explore how, even in the creative space, could we find a discrimination and creativity in all this. So um, I, with that, I'm going to have to close this panel. I'm sorry there, there's no time for questions, but they are going to be here, and you can come and tackle them and ask them all the questions you want. Thank you so much. Thank you.